Attention all personnel. Incoming podcast. This is MASH Matters. MASH Matters returns. The return of MASH Matters. (laughs) You thought you could get rid of us. But you can't. You cannot. No. Not that easily, anyway. We're like a bad rash. We just can't go away. A bad penny. <laughs> what, is it, what does that mean, a bad penny? I don't know. Somebody described somebody once to me. As, yeah, they're a bad penny. It's a penny is a penny. I, exactly. You get a hundred of them, you have a bad dollar. You have a bad dollar. <laughs> right? That's right. I'll take a I'll, bad dollar any day. I'll take a bad dollar, yeah. So we have a special guest here. Uh, it's a returning guest. Many of you have listened to the first interview that we did with this gentleman, and then he returned to uh, give us his take on the episode where we featured the audio from the table read because he co-wrote that episode. And now... Dan Wilcox is back again. Dan Wilcox is a terrific guy. He wrote with Thad Mumford. Unfortunately, Thad passed away, Mm -hmm. and they were both terrific guys. Dan still is, and it's great talking to him. So what we did was when we did the episode for the table read, we said, Dan, would you like to come and talk to us about bottle fatigue? And he said, sure. So we uh, we talked to him about bottle fatigue, and then we ended up talking for like 45 more minutes just about writing. And so what you're about to hear is the continuation of that conversation that we had with Dan. We just jump right in. We have questions. In fact, back, uh, I think late last fall, we put out on social media, hey, what questions would you have for writers of MASH? So if you submitted a question, you might hear your question in this interview with Dan Wilcox. Dan, I have a question that has nothing to do with bottle fatigue, but it's a question that's come up many, many times from some of our listeners. And it has to do with continuity. There are many instances in in MASH throughout the entire run of the series, especially early on in the series. For example, Hawkeye in one episode says he's from Vermont, when obviously Crabapple Cove has always been Maine. Margaret, uh, her father, is deceased earlier in an episode, and then he actually comes and visits the 4077th later on. There are instances where Colonel Potter says he's going to go back to his home in Nebraska when we know that his home is in Hannibal, Missouri. And and obviously now, in, in in an age of binging shows when you can watch an entire run of a series in a few weeks as opposed to 11 years. Nowadays, they're very particular about making sure these details are documented, I guess, like in a show Bible or or something like that. Was there something like that for MASH? And how did those little inconsistencies slip through? There wasn't something like it for MASH. We were sort of on our own with our memories. We were working with people who, I mean, Bert was there in one capacity or another, for every episode. One thing I would say, I hope I'm not sounding defensive, but I was there for the episode where Hot Lips' father came to visit. Mm -hmm. By the way, and I also wrote the episode where Hot Lips was accused of being a communist. And the worst thing about that is she's afraid her her father was so proud of her, and now he was going to be ashamed. Uh, Well, that implied that her father was alive, but nobody picked it up. Mm-hmm. But here's what, here's what I hope this doesn't sound just offensive. But if I had been offered a choice, if somebody had said, you know, we did a joke a long time ago, you remind me of my father, pause, pause, he's dead. <laughs> that's, that's the joke that that's, we're in conflict with. Mm-hmm. Or you can do an, you can ignore it, pretend it never happened, and do an episode where her father comes to visit uh, and she doesn't realize that she has a, a strength and moral fiber to watch surgery that he can't. Mm-hmm. That she learns about herself and her f- relationship to her father from this story, I would say do the important story. Mm-hmm. The other was a joke. It could have been any other joke they had in front of them that day, and they went with it. Mm-hmm. It works. It's fine. But jokes are the puppet beads, <laughs> the instantly, instant substitutions. If your problem is a joke, you make a circle around it on the page at the read through. You go back and you come up with new bit jokes for it. In the reading writing room, and in that writing room, when you sort of worked out a story, or you're trying to work out a story, I know there are. I've heard there are people, and you just said, "Gee, I, I normally didn't write jokes." So there are writers who are kind of specialize in, in writing jokes, and others who specialize in the story elements. Is that kind of the way the the marriage works in that room? Sometimes it's often how the marriage works in a in a team. Mm-hmm. And Thad was much more likely to do jokes than I was. Mm-hmm. 
but also there are specialists in the room. There are people who come in on rewrite night. All they ever see of the script, somebody sends them the script at four o'clock in the afternoon, and they have about an hour to read it and then come in, and the, the entire seems, team sits down and does a rewrite of that, finishing around 11 o'clock at night, unless there's a real problem. Okay, there are specialists who come in to do that work. They add jokes. They used to get paid then $15,000 a night. Not bad. Not bad. <laughs> For a night's work? Yeah. No. After a while, it runs into money. <laughs> so, yeah, there's, there's that. There are people who specialize, but you also need the story people, obviously. And on MASH, it was, it was both. I think that's – I didn't tend to do jokes – I remember the first time, it's a joke I didn't do, but I was about to. I was about to say it. It was in the the end of the one where Hot Lips is accused of being a communist. Uh, And they spring, they they set a trap for this congressional aide, and uh, Klinger pops the door open from inside. He's hiding inside her uh, grandfather clock and takes a picture, flash picture of the congressman with Hot Lips. And and the door closes on him, (laughs) and he says, what was that? And I was ready to pitch, and I was afraid it wouldn't go over. It's eight o'clock. <laughs> Gene Reynolds pitched it. Oh, <laughs> even so, I, I didn't mind. I was relieved that I had come up with the same joke that Gene Reynolds had. <laughs> yeah. I thought, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let my star shine next time. Sure. <laughs> we've we've also been asked a number of times about the some of the character changes and the transitions that go on that, that did go on over the years about Hot Lips and the way she sort of progressed and changed and even Klinger, uh, of course Igor didn't, but that's okay. Uh, but those <laughs> those characters had arcs and had changes throughout the years. Was that a conscious decision from the writers, or was that a an actor actress kind of suggestion that the writers then picked up on and, and ran with? I think sometimes either. Mm-hmm. Klinger's arc began to change when he became the company clerk. Yeah, and, and that was because Gary uh, because he left. So we needed you needed to know that he, well, even though he was the crazy guy he'd always been, if he got on the phone to tunnel you some medicine, you would get that medicine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He was going to do the job. So the character had to get a little more serious. Hot Lips, I wasn't there for the, I mean, that change was, was focused on an episode called The Nurses, and I was not there yet. Yes. Well, that and uh, I forget the one where Hawkeye and, I forget the name of the one where Hawkeye and Hot Lips make love. Comrades in Arms. Yeah. Loretta was, would say of that, that was a watershed. Once you've done that, you can't go back. Mm-hmm. So it did change how we perceived the character. I didn't always like that best because I, I thought her work was remarkable. I thought it was always remarkable, but, but I thought it was amazing that she could play a villain and make you sympathetic to her. Yeah. The watershed moments like that, were those planned out well in advance and thought out for the season? When when you're given an episode to write, when it features one of those watershed moments, what happens leading up to the writing of that episode? You know, the ones that I would have to look at are, oh, actually, I know, I know what I would look at, the way we handled Charles Emerson Winchester. I felt that that night coming new onto the show, we always knew how what Hawkeye was and how to write that. And we knew how to write BJ with him. Uh, and then Klinger, became, I learned the characters one at a time. And the, the last one to fall into place for me was Charles, because I didn't realize he had a sense of humor. <laughs> so I was watching an old episode. I, th- I think it's the one where they keep having to bug out. Oh, no, no. They're trying to give, from Korea, they're trying to give a reunion party in the States. Yeah, the party. And there's a, che- a scene where Charles has a letter that was written by uh, Radar's mother, Mm -hmm. where the grammar is excruciating. (laughs) Yes. And he reads it, but he can't help putting spin on every word. (laughs) Dear Walter, your Uncle Ed and me were real excited about the get-together. We love the whole idea. Hey, that's true. Lord, grammar is atrocious. First of all, should be your Uncle Ed and I are very excited or terribly excited. We won't even discuss idea. <laughs> Major, you don't have to translate for me. That's how she talks when she writes. Uh, anyway, they intend to come. And I, I thought, oh, I can write this character. I love this character. But some of that is stuff that you come across that's always already there. But in order to do that with, with Charles, we did a couple of episodes that explain that he's not as bad as he looks. Mm-hmm. There was one where we discovered he was funding an orphanage in Korea. 
I have no idea, what, but it was it's in my time. I can't tell you the name of it. The, the lovely letter that he wrote to his sister in, in uh, Bottle Fatigue. And there's one more. I think this character has feelings. He just doesn't share them with us. Mm-hmm. So there is a, something that happens with, with TV series. The secondary characters want to be leads. Whatever it is, it's made them different and an outsider to the core group of the story. So my sense was that Loretta was happiest when she was part of the solution, not part of the problem. Mm-hmm. I, I never met Larry Linville, but Alan said something similar about him, that he found it hard to play this detestable character week in, week out. Mm-hmm. Dan, we had a few listeners send us some questions too, and there's one from we we only have a few listeners, so that's, right, yeah, that's and, total and they all listeners. sent us questions. Yeah, on Twitter, uh, a listener who goes by Time for a Film asked this question: "said The beauty of this series is how it makes you laugh one minute and then cry the next. How difficult is it for the writers to be able to strike just the right balance between seriousness and silliness in a series like this?" Well, it's an ongoing problem. In a way, it's the same thing I was talking about when a clinger gets down on his hands and he's looking for a hand grenade pin and instead finds an earring. Yeah. And for a moment, remembers how much that mattered to him. I've been looking for this for weeks, <laughs> but it was too much. Sometimes you have to, then the rehearsal process helps with that. You have to try it and see if it works before you uh, give up on it. It's the only comedy series I ever worked on where tears were a legitimate response in the rewrite room. Oh, wow. Wow, that's great. Did you have a uh, preference uh, about a particular character that you really, really enjoyed writing uh, as opposed to another? I don't want to get into a person, but (laughs) just a character. Or if you want to go into a person, go ahead. I mean, (laughs) I I got much closer to uh, Charles Emerson Winchester's character. And to David, David, I sense, was very shy. Yeah. I tried being personal with him once. He'd, he'd done a TV movie in the summer before Stad and I joined the staff. And there, he had a scene in it that I thought was very powerful and it made me cry. And I was divorcing. And I said to David, that scene of yours, and I managed, I told him, reminded him the scene. So that gave me strength in my divorce. Wow. Oh. Couldn't process it. He didn't want to hear it. He said, you know who that actress was? Ah, oh, interesting. Wow. So was he a favorite character to write? Well, I've said a couple of times, because I got to write highfalutin for him, I, I liked that. Yeah. I mean, you also, you could write Klinger. That was fun always. Yeah. Potter, I, in a way, Dennis Koenig, Dennis was the one of us who uh, started writing Potter like a kind of a country, uh, I don't know, the, the example I gave is, it, uh, I've been looking into that problem and everything is both hunky and dory, <laughs> yeah. which uh, was a Dennis Koenig one. Is sitting in a, in a writer's room and having the discussions, you've got an executive producer, you've got uh, supervising producers, all kinds of different titles. And I know that some of those titles are basically given out in order to facilitate various pay and union issues. <laughs> But even so, I'm sure there's a certain hierarchy somewhere in there. Um, does that ever get confusing or does it ever, you know, is it ever kind of a push-pull kind of situation? Well, it's always clear and it has to be who runs the room mm. uh, and Bert ran the room. Mm-hmm. So you have to work within that framework. I remember an episode where we had two versions of the story going forward. It was a Halloween show, and uh, someone is stuck because they've just dealt with a bunch of wounded. There's a guy, a body with a toe tag in the back of a truck, and we see the toe moves. We see that guy's alive, but the unit doesn't know. Nobody knows, and and the body is going to be shipped with a bunch of bodies to uh, be uh, interred. And there were two versions of that story that could be told. One was finding him early on and treating him, and, and Bert had researched this and had a, a lot of treatment that he wanted to discuss. We can do this to him, we can do this, and then we'll bring him back at the end. Or you could do that same story as what's going to kill this man is that nobody knows he's alive, mm-hmm. which I preferred. I can't tell you why I preferred it, but it, it wasn't gruesome medicine point by point by point. It was this one moment, if somebody will be, please be looking in this direction when he moves, he's going to live. And I remember going up against my executive producer on that one. He had another way he wanted to do, which was a perfectly good way to do it. And I made a little speech saying how I saw it, and I shut up. (laughs) (laughs) 
certainly he uh, and that as you say you know you you inherited a lot of stuff from uh, Gene Reynolds and Larry Gelbart and the pattern and the kind of I guess the the dignity and the class and the elegance of all of that that was started by those two people sort of hung on and I I think Bert sort of picked up the uh, lamp and ran with it so you benefited from that obviously I've been very lucky in my mentors Bert is one of them and, and Alan Burns I was just lucky to have people like that critiquing my work and provoking better work. Yeah. Oh, that's an interesting thing. Yeah. So in those in those moments, is there that those kinds of challenges even among the other writers? Does that sort of help to elevate the the quality of the work? It can, and it did on Mash. Yeah. I've been on shows where the star wants it this way, so that's what we're going to do, even if it's dumb. <laughs> No, I don't want to name names. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I was just going, oh, oh, darn it. <laughs> How about initials? <laughs> rhymes with. <laughs> yeah, rhymes with. <laughs> well, I got a question. This is a wacky question. What do you, do you watch comedies today? Do you watch series and any of the shows? Do you have a favorite? The comedies, I don't. Yeah. Interesting. I'm not sure why. Uh, I'm much more likely to watch a, a drama. Yeah. About 10 years ago, maybe more, Mike Farrell did a documentary about MASH. One of the questions he was asking people is, what what on the air today reminds you of MASH? And I said, well, none of the comedies. Mm -hmm. So the closest I can come is The West Wing. Ah, yeah. 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 Which is absolutely in dead earnest when it needs to be and, and funny when it needs to be. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm, I've become more comfortable with dramas since then. Well, we're we're all kind of living one, so I guess. <laughs> <laughs> true. Yes. Yeah. Our listener Jamie asked if you could have written for any show that you didn't get a chance to. Which which show would it be, and why? Uh, well, what leaps to mind is Mary Tyler Moore, mm. which since I worked with Alan Burns successfully for years, I, I, I wish I'd had the shot. I think that may be well. If I could have been on your show of shows, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Just, just the yeah. value of being in that room, yeah, the, murder, the murderer's row of of writers, yeah. Gosh, the writers' room is such a uh, kind of a. It's all kind of a merry mysterious, and I. I've been asked a new numbers of questions about it. I've never sat in a writer's room, so I, I can't offer answers that accurate. I know people who have, like you, and we've had these discussions. But it's an amazing kind of conglomeration of brains that's come together in order to just kind of create this form, a television comedy. And, uh, you know, it's kind of unlike anything else, I, I think that I know of any other kind of business. I guess a lot of people sit around and say, well, how are we going to blow up, you know, <laughs> a country? <laughs> <laughs> They're not as funny though. They're not as funny. No. So, and you say that in the team between you and Thad, he was always more comfortable and was able to, to do jokes. Then you were providing more of a, uh, of a story or the theme or sticking to the story. How, how did that work? Making sure the, char making sure the characters stay true to themselves. Mm -hmm. It is obviously I could do a joke and I would now and then. The other one I remember doing, well, never mind. <laughs> there was a show where there was a, they had no newspapers. Mm -hmm. Potter had missed the episode where Lil, Ab Lil Abner gets married. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The joke, it just popped out of me. As I started to say it, I didn't know where I was going. So he finally got that, that panel in front of him of the, of the wedding. And he says, In the first picture, we see Ab and a beautiful Daisy May and her bridal outfit. <laughs> Shorts, halter, and a veil as she finally gets to utter those immortal words she's been waiting so long to say, I does. <laughs> <laughs> Which is funny, even if you don't know who Little Abner and Daisy May are. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. So I don't want to keep going back to this, but I, I'm fascinated by the process of, of writing a script. So you guys, let's say you and Thad, you've got the assignment. You're going to write the script. You know what the basic elements are. How does that start? Does somebody sit down and start typing and saying, you know, uh, interior swamp and here's what they say? Or do you do the dialogue between you? Or how does that, how does that work? All of those. Someone sits down in a typewriter. Thad and I switched off because the person at the typewriter has a lot of power. <laughs> can not type something that he doesn't like. And if you try to come back to it, say, oh, I don't remember. What was it again? What it gives the partner a chance to forget. 
So we would, I would type one day, he would type the next. But it's kind of a little bit of everything. It was hard to write uh, Potter without doing an impression of it. <laughs> you know, it's it's funny. It just it's it's so it, it's just what the job is. You, you don't have a lot of say. Somebody suggests a line. I, the other person either likes the line or says, "Or well, maybe it should be like this." And it's not easy. You're negotiating. It's one reason you have a partnership is to give you two opinions instead of one, backing up everything you've done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you're finally in that room and you're going to start writing that script, you already have a, a pretty detailed outline of, of what's going to happen. Is that true? Yes, including some of the dialogue. Including some of the dialogue. Mm. Okay. Somebody pitched a, a good joke in the, in the course of the laying out the story. Frequently it ends up, we used to put it on index cards and put them up on the wall. And is that outline created within the writer's room by numbers of people? Yes. Okay. Generally by the entire writing staff, unless someone's off writing a script. So then you get that outline that the people who are saying, okay, we're going to write the script, you get that outline and you have the benefit of that to start from. It isn't a question, oh gosh, we don't know what we're going to do here. Let's just start writing this story about Hawkeye. So you know basically the the you know the arc and the travel that these stories. You know are. the beginning, middle, and end. Yeah. You make sure it's entertaining along the way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Dan, how much guidance, if any, would you give to cast members who wrote episodes, be it Alan Alda or Mike Farrell or or anybody who wrote an episode? Well, with Alan, nobody gave many notes. With Mike, we did two, and on the second one, the writers had to step in and do enough of a rewrite that Mike insisted on sharing credit on it with all of us. I don't recall feeling that it was his fault. It was that the premise had, and I don't remember what it was about at all, but the premise had a problem that we had to solve together. We had one moment like that with Alan, where he had kind of painted himself into a corner. We were doing a story, it was... Hawkeye's, an older doctor, played by Alan's father, Robert Oler, has come to visit the unit, and they get sent up to a field hospital closer to the front. And back at the, at the 4077, BJ, to, to kind of just to give people something to do, has told everybody that tomorrow is Hawkeye's birthday. Mm -hmm. We went through several scenes on that. Of, but and then talking, It suddenly became apparent that we didn't have enough days going by. It was the same day that we were saying tomorrow is his birthday, and then when we say his birthday is here, it's the same day. And changing that took a lot of hands-on work, just getting out of that problem, which Alan didn't, was not happy about, and I didn't blame him one bit, but we had to do something. We couldn't say tomorrow is my birthday, now happy birthday. Yeah. And it was the one time I saw Alan have that experience, and, and I, my heart went out to him. That script he wrote? Yes. Okay. So he, as you say, he wrote himself into that corner then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Was there ever a storyline concept idea that you wanted to use that was either shut down or you could just never figure out a way to get it in there? Yeah, in some ways. I mean, here off the top of my head, we knew that at least one of the MASH units had done a, uh, had improvised a uh, kidney machine, artificial kidney. Mm-hmm to do renal dialysis. And they used parts. They didn't have parts. They used stuff that they were able to order from Korea, shipped to them from the States by uh, Sears Roebuck. If that sounds familiar, we did all that in an episode called The War for All Seasons, where a whole year goes by in one episode. And as I've mentioned to you before, is really one of my all-time favorites. Yes. Well, thank you. We couldn't do that story. It sat there because... It, there's a kind of an understanding in the in sitcom, in any kind of sitcom, that the time period covered by any episode isn't more than about two and a half weeks. We didn't have the time for somebody to write to Sears Roebuck, get the stuff back from Sears Roebuck, uh, make this machine. But when I realized we could make a whole year go by <laughs> and touch down on the highlights, Thanksgiving Day, to, uh, Valentine's Day, to help you know where you are in, in the year, that made it possible to do the uh, dialysis story and a couple of others. Oh, and also, Bert had always wanted to do something with making Charles Winchester bet on the Brooklyn Dodgers. Hmm. I guess that was 51. The year they looked like they couldn't lose, and they did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I'm fascinated going back to the idea of the uh, the soldier with a hand grenade in his pocket. It, it's amazing that you can take that moment. So we have that block. This is an interesting story of this moment in time. And then find a place to put it. So you're, you're building a world around that. 
uh, or integrating that into a world that is already there or already been built. I find that just as fascinating as kind of a, it's almost like a, a jigsaw puzzle trying to put the pieces together to form this 27 minute or however many minutes it was television show that just kind of rocked the world. It's sort of like a jigsaw puzzle. It is finding pieces that fit. And if they don't fit, try moving and maybe this will go in act one. Maybe this is, maybe we have to cut this. Or put it in a whole different show or put it somewhere. Yeah. We, let's, this isn't working in this one. Let's wait until, you know, March and put it in another show. You know who was incredible with that is Gene Reynolds. Ah. He was kind of pro forma meeting with the writers once a week. The, the latest version of any script, the last thing before it went to the read through, we would meet at Bert's house and read it out loud with Gene Reynolds. Mm. Gene always read Colonel Potter. <laughs> I remember him suggesting, oh, no, no. We had a two-parter we were doing. Gwen Verdon was in it with uh, the USO troop. Yeah. And we had the, the story came from a woman who had been in uh, Vietnam on a USO troop. Yes. And uh, actually had gotten wounded and taken to a mass unit. Well, they didn't have mass units. They had field hospitals. But she was taken to a hospital where she had an affair with her doctor. And there were a lot of incidents from that that just fit. We had a list of story events. We had a story for Klinger. We're going to have him try to take up with the uh, company comedian. Potter was the right age to have a, be tempted to have an affair with Gwen Verdon. So we had all these individual stories and maybe three or four scenes. We didn't know what would happen first, what would happen next, what would happen next. We hadn't laid out the story. And Bert said, let's make Gene earn his money this week. <laughs> When we were sitting down with Gene, Bert read him all the scenes that we had one at a time. This story is going to have this scene, then this scene, then this scene, then it's going to end on this. When he had read them all, Gene suddenly went into uh, high gear. I had never seen anything like it. And Bert was scribbling frantically in a pencil, trying not to break the point. Wow. Wow. And Gene said, well, you want to open with this. You want something nice visual. This will be okay. to open with this. Then, now we, then you got the Hawkeye story. Then... In about 15 minutes, he laid out one hour of television. It was a two-parter. Oh, my gosh. Wow. And I know I could never do that. Well, I could have, but nobody ever asked me, so that's all right. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> what a what a genius. What what a mind. Yeah. I, I used to love watching him. He would direct, and he would be standing there, and his eyes, he, he I think... I, I think he used to mouth the words as the actors were saying it. Ah. And he'd, he'd move his face, you know, with everybody's dialogue, which was really fast. I used to watch him rather than the <laughs> being shot. It was great. It was, like, it was great. Me street, we got to watch the Muppets rehearse sometimes. Mm -hmm. If you could see their faces while they were working, all the facial expressions in the way they were reading the line, was it was in their face. In their face, yeah. We've seen it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dan, you have to tell us which Muppet was the biggest pain in the ass to work with. <laughs> you know, you know, none of them were a pain in the ass to work with. They're, they're really, <laughs> I have a feeling I wouldn't have gotten along with Elmo, although the guy doing him was quite nice. He took over the film. Yeah, yeah. I was hoping to get some dirt on Mr. Snuffle up at yeah. this, but hey, that's fine. You know, whatever. <laughs> Pussycat. <laughs> and now he, he shows up alongside people. Yes. No adult human being ever saw him when I was on the show. Yeah. And the, the result was the audience had no way of knowing how big he was. Wow. The size of a small elephant. It was huge. Yeah. But he was standing next to Big Bird, who was already eight feet tall. So the Snuffleupagus looked not that big, like maybe like a pony. <laughs> Would you advise uh, somebody that wants to be a writer and someday wants to be Dan Wilcox and be able to talk on a podcast about what they've done and what they were able to create. I don't dare to aspire to that. <laughs> would you, what would you advise them to do? To go to school or start writing scripts or watch TV shows? Or what would, what would you say was the most important thing that they could do in order to get that career in the right direction? Well, Go to school, of course. You're going to need to be expert in all kinds of topics. Mm -hmm. Start writing scripts. Why not? But in general, steep yourself in it. I read comic books as a kid. Nowadays, comic books is one stepping stone away from screenwriting. Hmm. Huh. Yeah. Because you're articulating the pictures. You're the same thing you would do for a movie. For a TV series, you need to know what they're making now and why. I was watching, I was never a fan of Friends when it was on the air, but I watched a couple of episodes recently and thought, this is good. Yeah, I, I, I share that opinion too. I was never a fan of it when it was on, but now I've, at one o'clock in the morning, I think, yeah, that's not a bad show. <laughs>
Of course, at one o'clock in the morning, pretty much anything looks good. <laughs> <laughs> so does somebody, would you advise them, you know, there, there's so many people out there selling books and seminars and things, screenwriting books. You advise somebody, hey, go out and buy all those books and look at them or heck with the books or. Well, I think they can't hurt. But there are, there are people who know what they're talking about and there are people who don't. Yeah. So probably the safe thing to say is it depends on the book. Yeah. I was teaching screenwriting. I don't know if you know. I do know that. Yes. I disagreed profoundly with the book that we were working from, the textbook. But it had enough right in it that I, I was able to use it anyway. Huh. Interesting. Can you tell me the textbook? <laughs> the Sid Field book. Oh, Sid Field. Okay. The Sid Field book. Well, he's one of those kind of popular names that come up when people are trying to write screenplays. He's he's one of those guys that they buy that book, and there's a number of other ones. I've I've talked to some people who have written screenplays, and they say, well, you know, I, I I've read it, and I thought, gee, you know, I didn't like it. It was even of a TV show, and I thought I wasn't crazy about it. And and they said, yeah, but uh, you have to on page twenty six, this has to happen. On page forty seven, that has to happen. On page ninety four, that's got to happen. And you think, well, really? <laughs> It really has to happen page by page? The answer to that is no. No. <laughs> it does not really have to happen page by page. They're just trying to give you a sense of it. You know, basically, it's two thirds of the way through the story to the big turning point. And from there on, everything is heading toward the ending. Thad and I won a Writers Guild Award. And if we had it nominated, we could, could have won an Emmy for the, the show where Hot Lips is accused of being a communist. Mm -hmm. And if you look at that script, a congressional aide comes to visit. We don't know what he's doing here. Hawkeye and BJ take a dislike to him just because of what he is. They call him the home office of the war. And the act break is he finally tells them what he's doing here. and he says, you have got, you are harboring a communist in your midst. Ooh, uh, Major Margaret Houlihan. The story doesn't begin until that moment, and you're halfway into the script. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. So you take all these rules with a grain of salt. Yeah. And when we were talking to uh, John Rappaport a while back in episode 10, I believe it was, he told a story about that. The The mystery of that episode was kind of blown by CBS because in the commercials promoting that episode, he said he remembers hearing it on TV, hearing the announcer say, Margaret Akami? Yeah. <laughs> right. I remember it as Hot Lips, a communist? No. <laughs> oh, we've all had our steps toed on. I, I toes stepped on by the... Uh, the promotion people. Mm -hmm. I could tell you about a new heart episode, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, take, it takes a very long time, and you, you're not doing a podcast about. Uh, Save it for our new heart podcast. Yeah. we'll start next year. That's coming up. <laughs> okay. Well, hey Dan, you, do you have any other pearls of wisdom you'd like to leave us with? Because uh, we will let you go, so you can go off and have your ribs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, no, thank you. This is, it's been a pleasure. Well, it's it's been our pleasure. We really appreciate coming back and doing an encore show with us. And if there's anything that uh, Ryan and I can do for you, let us know and we'll be there. If I want to do a podcast, you can tell me how. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dan. Thanks very much, guys. Take care. Our thanks once again to Mr. Dan Wilcox for sharing his stories and his memories of writing MASH. That was so much fun. I am always fascinated, Jeff, uh, about the creative process and hearing those behind-the-scenes stories about what went into these episodes that we all know and love. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and hearing somebody like him talk about the, the process and what process he used and mm -hmm. that used. Oh, that's all fascinating. I mean, I, I am equally as fascinated by it. They're very talented, and to sit and be a writer and go through the the process that you have to do to to create the characters, create the the stories and the dialogue, and and work with other people, work with your partner, work with producers, and work with their other writers. It's uh you know it's it isn't easy. Right. And uh, talking to somebody like Dan, it, you learn a lot. And I I did. I always learn anything. You know, a lot of stuff when I listen to the writers talk about what they went through because it's a mm -hmm. very uh, eye opening stuff. And Dan is one of the all time nicest people in the world too. So. That was great. Thanks, Dan. That was a wonderful, wonderful conversation. And it makes me sad, too, that we didn't have the chance to talk to Thad Mumford. Very. Yeah. yeah. Very sad. Too bad. He was a good guy.
Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing the podcast with others. Keep it up. Uh, We just keep getting new listeners coming on board all the time. If this is the first time you've listened to MASH Matters, welcome to MASH Matters. Uh, You can go back and listen to our entire back catalog on any podcast player. You can also find all the episodes at mashmatters.com. You can find us on uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, YouTube. Uh, We are on Instagram. You can also email us, mashmatterspodcast at gmail.com. And you can call and leave a voicemail at 513-436. 4077. Or just call your Aunt Gussie and tell her. <laughs> call your Aunt Gussie and then Gussie can call, call us with your question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Hello, honey. How are you? I really like you boys. You're so <laughs> cute and funny, and I like with the elephant. That guy, the boy was on MASH. He's so <laughs> cute and funny. I love him. <laughs> Oh, gee. Oh. He's adorable. And the other fella is so cute. I don't know him, though. I don't know. I, I always thought he's a big, funny guy on MASH. He had a, kind of a big nose, but it's all right. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, until next time, <laughs> here's looking up your old address. <laughs>